Dr. Cohen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So excited to talk with you. Uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff to get into. Uh, you sent me a PDF copy of your book yesterday. I made it through about 25% of it. Unfortunately, I wow. couldn't read all 400 something pages. More than I get through, so good for you. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, I've got a lot of questions. Sure. Um, and so let's start off with personal care products because I just got out of the shower um, and I imagine many people just are completely oblivious to the things that they're rubbing on their body. So um, I think that would be a, a good place to start. Sure. Well, personal care products in the United States, just to start off with a bang, have absolutely no regulation when it comes to the chemicals that are put in them. And people are just like, what? But every time you buy something off the shelf that is not food, because food has different regulations, criteria for organic, that kind of thing. Personal care products can say they're organic, means nothing. They could have uh, you know, one ingredient that's organic and the rest are all synthetic um, and that's allowable on labels. So we really have no oversight, no regula regulation on products. And that being said, you know, most of the stuff we put on in the shower or personal care products in general have a fragrance. They have chemicals that keep the fragrance lasting longer, often called phthalates, which is a group of chemicals that some of us have heard about, or at least in your audience probably has heard about. Um, and we'll get into why they're harmful to human health. But the fact that we have all these untested chemicals allowable um, and never tested for safety, toxicity, or even harm in pregnant women or in children, or in those patients or people with uh, immune, you know, immune system disability, you know, problems. So, so again, most people don't even realize that when it goes into a shelf, you know, onto a shelf, that people think they're protected. That the government has some type of vetting process by which things can go into those products and onto onto the shelves. And in fact, that's not true. So, what uh, like are there any specific brands that you recommend or that you use personally? So I actually don't share brands as a rule because I work with major, you know, I'm working mm. with big academic groups. So, that you know, you'll sense. understand this, but that being said, the book doesn't limit anybody. So what I did was I figured out ways to get people to the right resources to look up, you know, the best water filters, the best ways to look up your lipsticks, your body sprays, your deodorants, what have you. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is you don't have to share the product because formulations change. And, you know, this happens quite often. I would never want to be responsible for, for even endorsing a brand where all of a sudden next year they get bought by another company and, you know, they're putting all sorts of different formulations together, which happens quite a lot. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is a lot of these regulatory wise, if you have a problem with any of the products that are on the shelf, um, the government, U.S. government can't remove them. It's up to the manufacturer, believe it or not, to, to do it willingly. Yeah. Um, and so it shows you that we have a real problem by the time some of these complaints or hair falling out or what have you, which we heard with some recent products, you know which one I'm talking about. Um, by the time it actually gets to the, to the media and other people hear about it is, is, is ridiculous because it's already been on the shelf even longer than the complaints started. So um, it's about the fishing rod versus giving people the fish. Um, I want people to always have the tools. And this is what I teach high school students, actually. I want people to be able to download the app, look up their products, understand the rating system from a vetted resource like EWG, Skin Deep. Uh, their database is in here. Um, but, but you should always be able to keep moving and grooving as products change um, and as your interests change. So, so that's kind of how I wanted to lay out the book. Yeah. So guys, that, that website that she referred is ewg.org. Uh, and then for the, the personal care products specifically, go to backslash uh, skin deep. And I, I checked out, checked that out. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic source tells you like what ingredients are in what, which could be dangerous. Um, and so yes, uh, ewg.org. Um, I want to go back to, uh, you mentioned high school students and uh, I know that story, but uh, how did so actually, let's go back to the story of your dog, Truxton. So yeah, that is he was, he unfortunately was awesome. a, a very sad story, but it, it sounded like it needed to happen because as a medical doctor, unfortunately, you were not given any of this information. So um, would you mind doing a little brief uh, overview of that sure. story, how you got into this? Yeah. And so this is part of the introduction to the book because I felt, you know, I really needed to cathart and tell people how I got into this and why it matters and why people should buy in 
to this concept that we need to think about environment and how it affects human health. Um, so, you know, about nine years ago, um, I was a young mom, I had two young kids, like, oh, I don't know, a year and three years old. And we had our, our golden retriever, who was our, actually our firstborn. He was the first creature that came into my life. And, you know, God knows he was the best at the time. I was exhausted. But the dog, Truxton, um, beautiful golden retriever, got sick. And we were like, oh, you know, maybe he swallowed a sock. Um, and we took him to the vet. And it turns out that, you know, within a week of bringing him to the vet, we found that he had what was called autoimmune hepatitis, which is an autoimmune disease by which the body's immune system, the dog's immune system attacks himself. Uh, over, you know, predominantly in the liver. And so his liver was actually the size of a golf ball by the time we actually diagnosed him, which meant that it had been going on for a very long time in general. And we didn't know this. Um, but what was unique about that experience is that not only do dogs not get autoimmune disease hepatitis regularly, but golden retrievers are even the most rare or one of the rarest breeds to get that diagnosis. And the irony is that I'm a, you know, the irony that I'm an autoimmune disease doctor for humans was just really heartbreaking because we ended up treating him um, as best we could as a human, you know, within reason and tried to really prolong his life, which he only had about six months left on that. But, you know, as I was looking at, you know, heartbroken, I was looking at why and how he could have gotten this bizarre diagnosis. And I was looking up his drinking water and whether the water was contaminated in our area. I was looking up his toys, the plastic toy that he always, always had in his mouth, really, since age of six, uh, 10 weeks. Um, I looked at his treats and wanted to know if his food and treats were may have been contaminated, his dog collars, you know, with pesticides in our area. We live in farmland. Anyway, so the long and short of it is as I was looking up things that could be, a, you know, have harmed him, I started unraveling this, this crazy web of information about how we are just unregulated as humans in the United States. And it really kind of blew my mind. I actually had moments where I'm in my kitchen looking around, seeing if there's anyone around to be like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And it was just such a wake up call. And I was even more astounded that the fact that I never heard about any of this, you know, the types of chemicals that work on the hormone system and affect the hormones of our bodies, um, the fact that air pollution can cause a whole host of health effects, including mental health changes, or, you know, we can put things on our skin, it actually gets absorbed into our bloodstream and you can measure it or in our urine. So, you know, I was kind of pissed and I was, I was upset that I had not learned this, um, you know, in medical school would have been nice. Um, it would have been nice in residency, but I was also wondering why is this not taught even younger, like in biology of high school? You know, so it really kind of set the ball rolling and it kind of opened up my whole professional career from that on that point on. Yeah. And so you are now one of the, the people who's going around and educating these high school students because you started off trying to market this to doctors. And from my understanding in the book, they just they basically wanted none of it. Um, and then you realize that to in order to stop this, to slow it down, at least is to get the information out while they're still young. And so do you want to talk a little bit about your experience talking with high school students about all their body sprays and endocrine disrupting yeah. products? Yeah, no, it's crazy. And so, you know, it had to be trial and error. You know, I started working on uh, with the big, with EWG actually, that you mentioned they're an incredible group, nonprofit that, that mostly toxicologists that really vet out a lot of chemicals and everything we do. So it's a wonderful, wonderful resource to get on for cleaning products or personal care products or looking for water filters. So we do a lot. Um, we do, we did promote them a lot because they're a great group. But um, so I reached out to them early on. I said, listen, I'm doing, you know, talks locally. Would you look at my slides? Um, and they couldn't believe I was interested. That's how bizarre environmental health was about nine years ago is that they couldn't even believe a doctor was interested in giving lectures around local, locally. You know, and I just, as you mentioned, I was just heartbroken because I went to, you know, we created a CME program for doctors and for two and a half years, I lectured to a lot of major programs. I mean, really good, big names, but no one was really that interested enough to even approach me after the meetings to change out their plastics in the neonatal intensive care units. You know, there's all these different ways you can improve the exposures to even newborns, infants, hospital, you know, hospitalized patients. And there's even nonprofits set up to do that. Um, but no one was really that interested. So I was kind of like bummed. And then, um, you know, as I, I did a Ted talk on this, you know, light bulb that went off when, uh, one of my kids babysitters in high school said, you know, Hey, is my, my shampoo harming me? 
And I was just like, what? You're interested? And sure enough, you know, I wanted to test out the hypothesis that maybe this is the right demographic. So, you know, I was allowed into Princeton High School by the principal and the head of science. And they said, come in, do whatever you want, and, you know, do, an, do a pilot project. So I gave a couple lectures and it was just overwhelming. There was such a resounding interest in this topic. And here's why teenagers are great because number one, they're super self-conscious. Like we all were, I mean, we still are, but I mean, we were back then even big time. And, you know, so they're always looking to make themselves prettier or healthier or whatever their angle is. It's they're, they're very body aware. Um, they're also tech savvy so they can manage apps and websites really seamlessly. I mean, I'm, my kids know more than I do when they're 11 <laughs> and 13. I mean, it's crazy. Um, they're also potentially one day going to have kids if they choose. They're going to one day vote for issues that matter to them, um, be it environmental or environmental health related. Um, you know, and they have a real, um, you know, interest in the future of the earth. And that message is really, um, you know, quite loud. And, um, but most importantly for me, from a doctor's perspective is, you know, we're teeming with hormones during this vulnerable period of growth and development, which is the adolescent teenage years. And it turns out that teenagers use the most personal care products per day than any other demographic. So on average, they use between 15 and 17, mostly young girls, but really teenagers as a set. And, you know, women typically use about 12 personal care products daily and men, you know, use six. Um, and so when you see this and you see that the chemicals that are in a lot of these products involve hormone disruption, and here you have a population of, of kids, you know, that are normally growing and, and having all these developmental change with hormones, these are called vulnerable periods of of uh, development where these chemicals may actually have more effect. Same with prenatal exposure, toddlers, teens, and even menopause. So these are big chunks of time where hormones matter, they're created, they're broken down, they're just kind of exploding. And, and that's why I thought it was just a perfect age to really you know, arm kids with tools to really make better choices as they move forward in their lives. I wanna circle back to the specific effects that these endocrine disruptors are having. But first, I'm, I'm pretty curious, uh, your perception of this, uh, how receptive are people to this info? Because from my viewpoint, every time I've tried to talk to anybody about this, they kind of like, unless, unless they know about this stuff, they kind of just like blow me off like, yeah, yeah, whatever, because they don't see it in the mainstream media or wherever, they don't really hear about it. So in your experience, how receptive have people been to listening to what you have to say? Yeah, it's a movement and it's actually a movement that's growing. And I'll tell you why I think it's growing. Number one, um, it's been an uphill battle and I'm, I'm happy to do it because, you know, I, I have a day job, you know, and I feel like I can say what I want to say and not feel like I'm getting fired, number one. But the world is looking. I mean, the world is already making statements about these chemicals. The World Health Organization has a monstrous report on environmental chemicals and how it affects health. Um, anyone can look that up, World Health organization um, environment program 2012 report it's about four inches thick this report the endocrine society which is a medical society that's worldwide they have all sorts of reports on this being a major issue uh, the american academy of pediatrics the american college of obstetrician gynecologists so in the last five to seven years this has really exploded and it's just getting bigger and bigger. And I'll tell you, I think one of the reasons why people are starting to listen more is because they're getting sick. You know, mm. I am an autoimmune disease, doc. I'm a rheumatologist, and I see more and more autoimmune disease, more and more breast cancer and other cancers, thyroid cancer, thyroid disease in young people than I ever I mean, for 20 years of medical practice, I've never seen anything like it. And it turns out that the numbers nationally and internationally, believe it or not, are actually increasing. And I think you now we'll talk about why these chemicals may have an effect because oh. there, there's a, you know, a group of chemicals out of the 90,000, that's the actually the number that we have available in all the products we use in the United States. So it's around 90,000 that have come out and been developed, especially after World War II. Um, just tons of different chemicals, pesticides and stain guards and nonsticks and degreasers and flame retardants and chemicals in makeup, food. We have 3,000 food additives that are allowable that haven't really been tested. 
Um, so we have tons and tons of chemicals, 90,000. And um, it's been discovered through third party, you know, academics, not manufacturers who are not required to do these kind of studies, but academic groups around the world have found that many of the chemicals out of that 90,000 are able to affect hormones in the body. Um, hormones, which are part of what's called the endocrine system in the human body. And these are signals. These are signalers. These are basically communication chemicals that go around the body and they tell, you know, your body to become more fertile, to get pregnant or breasts to grow during, um, you know, adolescence or um, bones to be stronger when it comes to osteoporosis or breaking down in terms of growth and development of bone. Um, insulin, which is part of how we manage sugar. I'm sure you've talked to your audience about that. You know, insulin is a hormone. And so we know that many of these chemicals can affect insulin, not only production, but also how it's broken down or utilized in the muscle tissue. Mm. Um, other, other hormones are thyroid hormone. I mean, I see so many young people, men and I mean, boys and girls in their twenties even that are on thyroid medications. And a lot of that has to do with the thyroid gland being ex exposed to a lot of environmental chemicals and how sensitive that gland is. So, you know, essentially we have all of these hormones that have the potential to be interrupted and disrupted by low level exposures to chemicals over time. So it's not just like, you know, you drink out of a plastic glass at some restaurant, boom, you got thyroid disease. It's more like the constant onslaught of chemicals from indoor air quality being poor, outdoor air quality, you know, drinking a lot of um, contaminated drinking water or having really processed foods regularly. So it's, it's a combination of environment exposure, genetics, which, you know, you cannot, you know, we know that we can manipulate genes, but we still get them, right? We have to work with them. And then, um, you know, lifestyle, how much you sleep, how much your stress is part of your life, you know, so it's diet, environment and genetics that decide kind of how your body is going to either be ill or well. And this is just one aspect that I want people to know about so they can work on it if they want to. And that's, that's why I created my program, the captain's lifestyle is because I started to realize that it's not just how much you work out. It's not just your nutrition. It's not just these personal care products. It's the combination of literally everything and doing that over time causes a lot of these issues. Uh, and one of the things in your book that you said that <laughs> I really love is your nose knows. So now that I have eliminated most of the, the, the harmful chemicals in my personal care products, now every time I walk down like the perfume aisle in a mall or anything like that, it's just like, oh my goodness, like instant brain fog. Um, yeah, it's crazy. And, and yeah. you know what, it's like people, and even if you didn't smell it, here's the other thing, like just like water that looks clear and doesn't have a smell, it can have plenty of contaminants, but you want to start with the nose nose is really the most obvious stuff. So fragrance in this country is proprietary. It's like a formula. It's like Coca-Cola. We as consumers are actually not protected and we're not allowed to know what, what chemicals make up that fragrance. So when you see a, just a very simply, if you see a product that has the word perfume or fragrance on the label, you can be assured that it has a very bad rating on environmental working groups rating system. Bing, ding, 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 it'll get like a, a red eight just to mm -hmm. average it out. And number two, you can imagine that there's gonna be over 200 or 300 chemicals that are often included in that word fragrance or perfume. So, you know, all bets are off once you see that on a label. So you really, you know, if there is nothing else people look for at the very start of this journey, that's kind of a, a good one to look through. But we give like labels and we tr try to teach people how to go through all this stuff in a very, very simplistic way, because that's what I needed back in nine years ago. I mean, this is the book. Someone actually brought this up and I didn't even think about it. But she said to me, you know, it looks like you created the book that you wish you had. And it's absolutely the book I wish I had because that's, I was a novice and didn't know anything back then. So it would have been great to have something to, to kind of fast track me into a little healthier lifestyle. Yeah. Um, I want to circle back to water because you just mentioned that. Uh, but before that, you, this is also in your book, you mentioned that it's, it could be effortless to incorporate these switches into your daily routine. It's not you, like, you're not saying that you have to eliminate all fragrances fragrances, if I can talk, but just like switch them out with naturally scented, like with uh, essential oils. And it's not like you don't eliminate any of these things, just trade them out for the, 
more natural products. It's, it's a whole swapping process. And honestly, it's swapping at one shampoo for another shampoo that's a little safer. Maybe it didn't work as well as your crappy shampoo, but then you can kind of work through a bunch of shampoos until you get the right one and then you're done. And you do the same thing. I mean, you can swap out M&Ms for safer versions of M&Ms. There's pretty much a hack for anything out there if you look for it. And when it comes to habits, um, you know, one of the examples I like to use is I'm a tea drinker. My husband's a coffee drinker. And, you know, when you have a habit, that's a great place to start because that means that you're doing it every day. And so maybe tweaking that just a hair will make it a safer habit. So for drinking tea, then I always drink out of a glass, you know, kind of pitcher or kettle, I should say, is what I cook it in. I have a stainless steel diffuser in it, which I put loose leaf tea instead of tea bags, because tea bags now we know have a lot of microplastics when they're heated up. They're made of nylon, rayon, and a bunch of plastics. People don't realize that they're not always silk bags. And if they're silk, they may have been coated with, you know, plastic on the silk. But either way, each one of those changes that I made took me a while. Like I didn't think like overnight, like this is how I'm going to have clean tea. It, literally, I kind of kept on thinking, well, how do I get it cleaner? And eventually I created this system where you know, everything's glass, everything's stainless steel, loose leaf, organic. When it's heated up, it won't release all those pesticides that are grown with tea and coffee, manufacturing chemicals, um, you know, packaging chemicals, um, because heat really does release a lot of junk from stuff. Unless mm -hmm. it's stainless steel and glass, it's got a little bit stronger matrix. So, you know, you're, you're always better off with those kind of containers. Yeah. And I think that's super important to uh, kind of emphasize to people like you're not saying like today you have to go out and replace everything in your home because then people will just be overwhelmed and not do anything it's just like when something runs out look for a more natural option and slowly over time then you have this whole home of natural products um and, then and it's cheaper it's it's actually very much it's very interesting that when you get down to the least amount of products that are higher quality or at least cleaner you're not buying as many air fresheners which are wastes of money and harmful to your health you're not buying carpet powders and you know um, fabric softeners and all these extra chemicals that we think we need because we were told and marketed to that we needed them mm -hmm. um, you know once you don't buy them and you don't bring them into your home a you don't get exposed but B, you're saving a lot of money. Um, and there's just so much you can do with natural stuff like white vinegar for cleaning. And we give recipes for all this if you choose to do it, you know, baking soda, natural lemon juice, um, sea salt for scrubbing is great. And, you know, look, I don't have time for any of that. You know, I'll be honest. I have the recipes. They all work great. I did them all. I worked through them. But you know, I, I buy products that EWG vets is safer products for cleaning, you know, so there's options for everybody. And, you know, I just want to give everyone, whatever your background in science, whatever, or no background in science, whatever your economic situation. So this is not for just the rich people of the world. This is about everyday people um, being able to have very safe, clean options in terms of produce and food and, and personal care and everything. And even radiation. I have a whole chapter on how to manage technology safely, because we're not getting rid of technology. In fact, we're relying on it more and more with quarantine and COVID. So it's a matter of how do you um, learn about your phone and your computer and how it shouldn't be near your groin. It shouldn't be in, you know, carrying your phone in your bra because of all the radiation and what the science shows. So this is, again, this is me conveying the science that's very robust. And on that note of these switches being cheaper, especially in the long run, you gave a stat in your book that, that says uh, in the United States alone, the cost of disease uh, and lost wages is estimated around $340 billion. So because all these products causes disease over time, if you eliminate them now, that you save a trip to the hospital later on down the road. You know, our, our humans have a hard time with delayed gratification. I mean, yes. we, right. I mean, we all love instant everything. Right. And uh -huh. I'm one of those people. Right. But what you're also banking on from this kind of conversation, like what you do every day is that when you put in the work for a healthier body now, it will pay off for you later. Mm -hmm. And so this is just one more layer into, you know, doing everything you're doing with exercise and training and sleep and, but it's just another layer that people aren't always aware of and it contributes. I mean, you can make a fabulous salad and then carry it around in a plastic bowl that, you know, maybe it's leaching into your food or maybe you're making this great omelet, but it's in a nonstick pan. Mm 
Mm. So you've got this fabulous egg omelet with vegetables and it's high quality. And yet you're getting all of these like nonstick chemicals that we know are on nonstick pans yeah. into the food, especially fatty foods, which it loves even more. So, you know, it's just, it's just when you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. That's all. So let's uh, change topics a little bit and go to water. So in your book, there is a picture of when you changed out your reverse osmosis water filter. And <laughs> it, it, it looks like you just picked up like a, a dirty, muddy pipe from the ground. Like it, it looked absolutely disgusting. And also it, it says uh, there's a list in your book of the, the stuff that is not filtered out from water. That was just astounding to me. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about sure. um, tap water, especially in, in the United States? Yeah, this is one of my favorite and actually I think most important topics that I, that I didn't know much about, but now I'm so well versed on it from all this research that I'm like, oh my God, I have to really share this with people because it's just, it's hard, it's mind blowing. So, um, so the very basics are that in the United States, we have about 310 million, I guess, is the number of people in the country now. Um, about uh, the majority of people, 310 million, are, are given water through their municipal tap system. So, you know, city water. Mm -hmm. You know, you turn on your tap, it's not from a well, it's from city water. So there's 160,000 water treatment plants across the country that serve about 250 million Americans, so the majority of Americans. The, the rest of the Americans, like 40 million, get their water from wells, private wells, um, in their more rural areas where they don't have all the piping that goes from these waste treatment plants. Now, what's interesting is these 160,000 water treatment plants actually only follow a law about cleaning water that's from 1976. And it hasn't really been updated since 1976. So and it good. covers... 91 chemicals. So since 1976, now we have 90,000 chemicals everywhere from water in our streams. It lands on, you know, the air quality lands onto the streams, the, you know, lakes and sewage becomes drinking water. People don't realize that. So we have medications in toilet water that go into our drinking water, microplastics. But, you know, it turns out that only 91 chemicals are are required to be looked for and managed if they're too high, if they're found out to be too high in those treatment plants, then they have to fix it, they have to remediate it. But 91 chemicals. And so these guys, I say guys, cause I visited them. I, I did a tour of um, one of the big ones in New Jersey where I live and they were great. These guys, you know, the people that work there do their job well and they, they cover these 91 chemicals by law, they're doing their job. But unfortunately, like the infrastructure doesn't isn't modernized to deal with all the chemicals that we've had since 1976. And um, plenty of the chemicals that don't even break down over time, like the nonstick chemicals or perfluoroalkyls, PFAS, it's in the news a lot right now, they actually go right through water treatment plants too into our, our um, water system. And then the water travels like this treatment plant, you know, 40 miles to my house in PVC piping right? Because everything is not lead anymore, right? We have laws against that. Not every, I should say, not all of it's been changed out, but certainly when they do make changes, they change out the lead. And then now you have polyvinyl chloride, which actually is an endocrine disruptor, uh, which gets hot from hot weather and leaches into the drinking water. We have chlorine that's required in our drinking water, detergents in our drinking water. And so what I recommend, I mean, instead of making everyone depressed, is really trying to give people the best options that I came up with to handle this you know, trying to come up with the solutions to all of these issues. And the solution is really filter your water at the point of use. So whether the water is coming up from the ground, from a well, which has its own issues, or it's coming from a treatment plant, um, you have the opportunity right there before it goes into your body to filter it before it hits your glass. And then I talk about a variety of fil filtering systems, which are the pros and cons and price points and kind of giving people an idea that it's really um, available to everybody. People can get really aggressive water filtration systems for 300 bucks, 250 bucks. Um, and that's what I'm trying to promote because it's just so, so important for human health and our health of our bodies and our kids' bodies to really think about, um, you know, water and how to make it the cleanest it can be and how to carry it in, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of containers, BPA free is just BS. And, you know, yeah. so we have to think about all that. So I've known about contaminated tap water for a while now. And um, I've also known about um, like the harmful effects of plastic. So you shouldn't buy water in plastic bottles. And then we switched to drinking like the, the sparkling waters from aluminum cans. 
But then in the book, I saw that lining of aluminum cans can contain BPA. And so now I'm like, shit, now I got to yep. glass yeah, bottles. It's mind blowing. And yes. it's funny because, you know, you get these healthier and healthier drinks, but they're in cans, but cans have not changed. So cans are lined with a plastic coating called bisphenol A or BPA. And some of your audience members may remember, um, especially if you're a parent, that in 2012, bisphenol A or BPA was actually taken out of baby bottles, plastic baby bottles, because of its harm, its endocrine disruption capabilities that people didn't want. You know, like, you know, the US actually took that off the market for that product, which is unheard of in the US. Um, and actually, the person who's really largely responsible for that move is actually my co-author, Fred Von Saal, who's just this world-renowned neurobiologist. So he's my co-author for this book and my last um, textbook with him. So he's incredible. He's like an emeritus professor, researcher. He's just mind-blowing. But um, BPA is an endocrine disruptor. It's probably the most widely tested and uh, researched of all of the endocrine disruptors because it was one of the first discovered. And it mimics estrogen at very low levels and it blocks androgens. So it can affect you know, cognition and brain development in utero. So during pregnancy, it can actually affect the genitalia of male uh, babies um, because it blocks the androgens. Um, and we know that this can be um, accumulated through diet and water and, and things that the mother drinks. Um, not that it's their fault, trust me, but it's because we live in a dirty world and it's not always fixable or people don't know about these things. But BPA, um, is something that actually breaks down, you'll be happy to know, in about six hours. So it's just one of the chemicals that you can eliminate from your lifestyle, your diet, it's on currency like um, receipts, it's on um, currency meaning like money, uh, believe it or not, that's, that's lined with the BPA coding. Um, it's in a lot of different products and we list them in the book. But if you actually start avoiding canned foods and do and, and kind of change out to frozen foods that are or hopefully organic, but frozen versus canned. If you drink sodas that are out of glass, um, which is what I always look for, believe it or not, they still exist. Um, you know, if you can make those changes, there are studies that we talk about in the book that show that you can reduce BPA levels in your body within a day or a couple of days. And I give a study about soup and how they changed out their soup, just one meal a day from... Uh, canned soup, it was Progresso in the soup, believe it or not, to, uh, in, yeah, in the study. So um, to fresh soup without the can, all else being similar, this is a Harvard study. And um, the participants, 75 of them had a 1000% reduction in BPA in their urine That's within incredible. five days. Yeah. So you wow. can see that certain chemicals you can really fight back at and BPA is one of them. And we want to, you know, make sure people know that. Yeah. So uh, on that topic, these are pretty popular among the fitness community. These blender bottles, oh, just really? these plastic blender bottles, they have a sticker that says BPA free, but then in the book, there's like BPA is not the only endocrine disrupting plastic. So how harmful would it be to drink from a, a plastic shaker bottle as opposed to a stainless steel tumbler? Yeah. And then, by the way, that stainless steel tumbler you showed me, the top of it is plastic, right? Yes. So it could be stainless steel inside and then you're drinking hot coffee right out of the top plastic part. Mm. So, or even the flip tops, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of flip straws. So it's kind of like, it took me almost six months to figure out that that, again, it's a journey and, you know, not everyone just figures it out or just picks up on it. But once you're aware, you start to see things as you move along. So in terms of those plastic, um, containers. This is the way I see it. You know, again, you can't just throw up your arms and just give up every single thing you love or behavior. I mean, my hair is colored. If people could see this right now, I'm not sure if they're going to see this video, but you know, I color my hair and I'm, I, I do everything else. I hopefully much better, but this is something I haven't decided to change out in my life. And so it's a journey for everyone, but those plastic containers, you know, as if you can find an alternative that's stainless steel, and I guarantee you, if not now, it will be sooner or later, um, then I would, you know, try to do stainless steel or glass if there's a possibility to have those, you know, in those materials. If not, the biggest issue with plastics comes from heating them or putting them in the dishwasher. Mm. So if you take like, say, Tupperware that's brand new, it's totally see-through and you put it in the dishwasher when it comes out yep it gets cloudier and cloudier and cloudier 
And it's not because it's dirty. It's because the material, the matrix actually starts breaking down and breaking down under heat and all the scratching of the storage. And, and so what you're starting to have is a, a material that can actually get into your food. So I would argue that if you're not, if you're going to wash it by hand, if it's not sitting in the heat, if it's not put in the dishwasher at high heat and you don't put hot foods in it, that's your best chance of having a safe product. BPA free doesn't really mean anything. There's, there's all these substitutes called BPS. They call them regrettable substitutions. BPS, BPSIP, a bunch of others. These are bisphenols, um, like BPA. And what the chemical industry does is just replace one with another. It's like whack-a-mole. And it's leaving all the researchers and consumers just, you know, like left without any, you know, real information or power. It turns out BPS is actually worse now. We have enough data now that the regrettable substitution is truly regrettable. So uh, I wouldn't go for that marketing if you can avoid it. Okay. Uh, real quick, I just want to like this last thing on plastic, because uh, I do want to get into uh, organic produce and, and things like that sure. and air quality if we have time. Uh, but this plastic container that I'm holding right now, um, there are fortunately not many scratches on it now because my girlfriend Brooke is pretty good at um, not putting it in the dishwasher, microwave, things like that. Um, and then I like the little jingle that you put in the book for the looking for the uh, the number. Uh, at recycling the of the codes, yeah. Yep. Those are the, so, the triangle recycling codes are really interesting because I never knew what they were and now I do, and it's shocking. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for, just for people listening, it's if I'm if I remember correctly, it's five, four, two, and or no, five, four, one, and two. All the rest are bad for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you can do it six different ways. I don't know. In fact, when you said that, I'm like, oh no, I don't remember it. <laughs> but I know which ones are bad. So, you know, so basically the recycling codes, uh, which is really the triangle on the bottom of plastic containers. Okay. And if people start to look at them, they'll start to see, oh my God, there is a triangle with a number in it. And the numbers are one through seven. And it was really started by the Recycling Society in 1988 to recoup, they wanted to recoup money from their plastics. It was not done for any altruistic reason. It was done to make money and for the plastics industry to somehow recoup some of the plastics and the expenses. Um, it turns out that we can use those numbers to our advantage. So we now know, unfortunately, because of research that number three is polyvinyl chloride or PVC, which tends to have more endocrine disrupting capabilities that six is styrene or styrofoam. We all know styrofoam, right? Um, and that is, um, that's a carcinogen, believe it or not. So uh, styrene is the active chemical in that. So you wanna to try to avoid anything hot in styrofoam. And that seven, which is typically called other, if you look it up on the internet, because these codes are really everywhere. You can find this whole chart. Um, that's usually other, but tends to have BPA products uh, or BPA in the products that have a seven and a triangle. So if you stick to one, two, and five, you're generally better off. Um, but again, it's not a perfect system. It's just kind of a way to really guide you and make you feel better about your choices. Yeah. All right, so switching topics again, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in California, basically the whole state is on fire. And so air pollution is becoming a big deal. Uh, do you wanna talk a little bit about that and ways to reduce some of the effects? Yeah, I was there in the fall of last year before, God, pre-COVID, I guess, way before pre-COVID, and I couldn't breathe because it was during the fires, and I went out mm. for a run, and it was the dumbest thing I'd ever done, but, you know, I'm from New Jersey, so I wanted to go out and have a run, and by the time I got back to the hotel, I couldn't even breathe. My throat was burning and everything, so it really kind of was a wake-up call for what you guys go out, you know, what's going on out there, and in other parts of the country, it's pretty shocking, and, and really, it's important to know what to do about it. Um, what I recommend people to do is clearly when the outdoor air is worse than the indoor air, typically the indoor air in parts of my areas, you know, the indoor air is better. I mean, I'm sorry, worse than the outdoor air. And that's usually because of chemicals like carpet powders and all these crazy air fresheners that we are supposed to buy to cover stinky things. And, you know, all the chemicals we bring into the house, incense, candles that are synthetic, all that. But out there, the outdoor air is so much worse in terms of health conditions. So, you know, the way to think about it is what can you, you know, I hate to say purchasing a big air filter system, but they do have cheaper versions of them. They even have them for cars, car filters. I know my husband used to commute and he had a mini filter that plugged into his um, 
you know, uh, lighter or whatever you call it, the AC adapter. Um, but you can get reasonable air filters if they're still available and, and you know, within cost for your home. You can think about watching the venting in your home, the HVAC system, to make sure that you're not getting any, you know, losing the return of good air for the bad air. Um, you can also do fans backwards. I mean, you could take a fan and turn it backwards and you can kind of keep out air from outside, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like reverse logic. Um, what about you plants? Can, what do you say? What about plants? Like plants are fabulous. Okay. So plants are great. I mean, I don't know how many plants you can put in a home to really compensate for this level of smoke that you guys are dealing with. But, on, but for the most part, there's plenty of good studies and we put them in the book that when you have plants like money plant and Dracaena and mother law's tongue, all, all very available plants, house plants, that they actually clean the air and they do a nice job of it. And the more plants you have, the more likely it's gonna do better for your air. So we really need to embrace those kind of things for our home. Plus they feel good, they, you know, nature, stress management, plants are just wonderful. So, um, but I think that's a wonderful, you know, we have that in the book and there's a bunch of other suggestions, but it wasn't necessarily pointing to major fires. You know, mm -hmm. it was more like, you know, living in an average home in, in America in modern day. So, you know, there's probably a whole host, I would imagine, of resources now available because, you know, this is a real thing and it's ongoing. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's worth considering even extra stuff besides plants and filters and, and consider, you know, wiping down surfaces um, that you can touch from soot, from smoking and cigarettes, we know. So clearly it's going to land on furniture and get in your home. So wiping down those surfaces so you don't get any skin exposure or dermal exposure is a really good way to also work with um, the chemicals outside your home. Okay. Uh, so we've only got a few minutes left and I want to at least briefly touch on glyphosate before we give you a chance to uh, tell people where they can find you. Um, so glyphosate, I've gotten in arguments with some people, including family members, saying that glyphosate is not all that harmful. Harmful, um, but as we know, it <laughs> that is definitely not the case. So, do you want to go over some of the dangers of glyphosate, GMO foods? Sure. Yeah, and this is personal because I live in the corner in New Jersey of 200 farmed acres of glyphosate. Mm. So I'm now working with the farmer to come up with alternatives. It's it's a and he's an old school guy. These are like really. Yep leather hand, hundred year old farmers. So this is not easy. Uh, I bring over beers, you know what I mean? When we're going <laughs> to chat, but um, you know, glyphosate is a, glyphosate. what'd you say? That are filled with glyphosate. Well, it's true. Beer now is filled. <laughs> it has glyphosate. Good Unfortunately, point. And, yes. But, but if you go organic, my favorite beer is organic. So, you know, basically I do wine and beer. We do a whole section actually on alcohol because it's one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't drink a lot of it, but I like it high quality and I like it without glyphosate if I can yeah. get it. But anyway, um, glyphosate is um, Roundup. A lot of people have heard of Roundup. It's been marketed through all the big box landscaping stores and, you know, um, for years. And it, and it really has been on the market for years. But what's gradually been discovered about glyphosate or Roundup, which a lot of people use and even in their gardens, not just farmers, is that it actually is very uh, potentially harmful to human health. And highest on the list is car cancer. Um, and so it's a probable cancer um, through the World Health Organization. Um, and uh, it's been banned in Mexico now. It's been banned in all the parks in Miami, public parks. It's been banned in so many places. Europe is considering banning it from the entire EU, uh, European Union. So um, we know that there's huge million dollar lawsuits that have passed recently. Um, one gentleman who was a landscaping guy for the grounds guy for his high school, who came, became very sick. I think he developed multiple myeloma, which is one of the cancers, or leukemia. I can't remember which one it was specifically, but he won $58 million in that settlement. And that is sort of the, that was you know the, the first lawsuit that really started everything tumbling down. Now, glyphosate is made by Monsanto, which is one of the oldest chemical companies in the country. And they also make the seeds that are paired to glyphosate. So all mm -hmm. these farmers, unfortunately, are stuck with these seeds that are what are called selective to this herbicide glyphosate, which is, you know, herbicide is for weeds. And, um, you know, unfortunately, because glyphosate has now has to be sprayed repetitively, it used to be just thought of as one spray, but now we know there's resistance and weeds are just growing back 
you know, even despite the glyphosate, there's multiple sprayings of glyphosate. So now we're really getting into a situation where we have glyphosate in almost every, uh, you know, processed pro uh, food. Um, and so it's something we have to really think about. It's going to end up, I would imagine, kind of moving out of our system, but it's not soon enough. And in the meantime, we have it in cereal. EWG did a great report on cereals that they tested, really our morning cereals that we all love, filled with glyphosate, or at least higher than what's considered healthy, you know, or safe. Mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say healthy, but safe. Yeah. Um, and so we have glyphosate kind of seeping into almost every vegetable or produce. And we give the list of which vegetables and produce have um, what are called genetically modified seeds that are modified to match glyphosate, which means they probably have much higher levels of glyphosate. And so we give people all the information they need to know to be able to consider which produce to buy um, in season, not in season, whether it's organic or not. And so that's really helpful because it's, again, empowerment mm -hmm. for people to make great decisions for themselves. Yeah, so moral of the story, buy organic. If you can't buy organic, wash it in a water and vinegar solution. Or baking um, soda and water. And yeah, and you just agitate it. You'd be amazed what the water looks like. Um, so there's, there's really, um, for people who have no access to organics, even frozen organics, which are somewhat more accessible, you know, we want to make sure anyone who has uh, the ability to buy white vinegar at the store can really do the same um, you know, improve their fruits and vegetable residues, you know, for pesticides and remove them as well as someone with, you know, who's, who's able to buy pes uh, uh, organic produce. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have an Instagram live to get to. Oh, uh, yeah. So tell people where they can find more about you, your book and everything you're doing. So the book is called Non-Toxic. I'll hold it up because I'm still not sure if this is going to go out anywhere. So I might we'll as well just cover my, cover my bases. Um, so it's called Non-Toxic. Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World. Um, it's published through Oxford University Press. It's part of Dr. Andrew Wiles' uh, Healthy Living Guides. And Dr. Andrew Wiles, a, a pretty famous gentleman who, you know, really is the forefather of integrative medicine um, and holistic healing. And he's, he's really quite well known. So, um, so this is part of that series. And this is the second book in that series. And many more will come out. Um, but people can find this on Amazon. They can find it, I believe, Barnes & Noble, but not sure. There's some independent bookstores that are online that I would love to you know, help serve too, because I'd like them to get a piece of, of sales. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially, most people have been going, I think, to Amazon because it just has more stock. Um, I would love people to follow my tips and recommendations and, and nuggets of information. I post Monday, Wednesday, Friday on uh, my platform called The Smart Human. Uh, that's my educational platform. I don't sell anything. I don't endorse anything, as you can imagine, except for my book, which I think I deserve. Um, and then uh, it's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram as The Smart Human. The website, thesmarthuman.com, has podcasts, radio shows, print material, um, resources. Um, so that's really how I want people to keep going with their great choices or learn in nuggets, something not overwhelming and kind of keep it going, not just for the book that they may have time to read here and there, but really just kind of an ongoing feed of, of promoting healthy lifestyle um, through some of their choices. And I make it entertaining. Fridays are usually mental health Fridays. I usually have something very funny if I can. I usually do Mondays or sustainability and how to keep the earth clean or cool inventions. And then Wednesdays typically like, you know, a heavy hitter about nutrition, diet, exercise with lots of bulleted information. So, um, I hope people will check it out and, and share with family and friends. Love it. Yeah, guys, like I mentioned, um, I have the PDF copy of the book. I ordered the full copy, but that doesn't get here till the end of the month. I'm about 25% through and so far it has been mind blowing. So please, please, please pick up a copy of this book. Um, I mean, you might not like the things you see, but that's good because you can slowly start to implement these changes into your life and live a, uh, a better lifestyle. All right. So uh, Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for coming on the show and spreading your wise words of wisdom to my audience. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Taylor, thank you so much for reaching out and for having me on your show is actually really fun. And, uh, and I, I hope your audience finds it fun as well. So thank you for having me.